Thank you. Um, I am thrilled to be here in Lambertville because I only live in Upper Bucks County and uh, I've been running around, we've been running all over the country talking about the book and uh, to be able to do and go sleep in my own bed tonight is a wonderful thing. Uh, it is very hard, I, I, there's no way I can tell you the whole story of, of Al Hirschfeld here and uh, uh, it was hard enough to fit it in between 300 pages in the book but I'm going to tell you a little bit and I want to also talk about um, there's a piece coming up uh, for auction here. When is that? Next week. Um, that is a, a Hirschfeld print of um, Frank Sinatra and Luciano Pavarotti. And on the face of it, it would seem like, well, this isn't, you know, it's not theater. Uh, and Hirschfeld's been associated with theater. He only drew it for 76 years. Um, we think of him as a New York Times artist, and there's a good reason for that. He was uh, on, in the paper on average every other week for 75 years. Um, but that represents less than half of his work. Uh, it, before he was a New York Times artist, he was an MGM artist. Uh, he did more posters and uh, publicity drawings for MGM films than any other artist. Uh, there are people who know him as the TV Guide artist because he did more covers for TV Guide uh, than any other artist. He did over 40 um, over five decades. Um, if you go to New York Union Square, there's a uh, used record store called Secondhand Rose. They have a whole section devoted to Hirschfeld album covers because when they started doing album covers in 1938, Hirschfeld was one of the first artists to do album covers and he did so many over the years and so many classic ones that uh, you would uh, recognize. Um, again, although we think of him in theater, a big gateway drawing for uh, uh, audiences um, of a certain age was an Aerosmith album. Uh, in 1977, they did an album called Draw the Line and the art director at Columbia had this bright idea that Hirschfeld should draw the cover for an album called Draw the Line. And uh, so Hirschfeld liked to draw from life and he went up to uh, Bearsville, New York and uh, he, uh, he saw the band recording. Now they were at the nadir of their drug use and Hirschfeld himself was 73 years old and uh, it should have been a disaster. But for Hirschfeld, it was, they were characters, and he loved characters. That's what he was really good at capturing, is the character of his, of his subjects. Um, it, when pressed, you know, he, he was, he's the greatest characterist of the 20th century, maybe of all time. But the uh, complete crazy thing, Hirschfeld would call it insane, which was his seal of approval when he talked about things, was he didn't really practice caricature in the traditional way that we th when we think of caricature, we think of it, we think of it as a put down. We think of it as uh, gross anatomical distortion, big heads, little bodies, and yet Hirschfeld did none of those things. He really created a vocabulary of his own. I like to say uh, uh, that he wasn't the best at what he did. He really was the only one who did what he did. Um, and now this drawing of Aerosmith, by the way, o uh, literally almost broke up the band. Um, when he finished the drawing, uh, it, he sent it over to Columbia. The, the art director said, it's great, it's fantastic. Can you do one exactly the same? And, he, and Al, was, who was very uh, allergic to, to repeating himself, di really didn't want to do it. And he said, why should I do that? And he said, well, because there are two band members fighting over the drawing. And if you don't do another drawing, they're going to break up the band. So uh, Al Hirschfeld kept Aerosmith together. He almost broke them apart, but he kept them together. Uh, so, but to get back to Sinatra and Pavarotti, this was done in 1981. The two of them were giving a concert for uh, uh, Sloan Kettering, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And uh, he did this drawing for the poster. And it was so good and it was so popular that uh, his print publisher, George Goodstadt, up in uh, Connecticut, uh, decided to publish it as a limited edition etching. Um, the printmaker that he used was uh, Emiliano Sorini, who was a great printmaker who worked with uh, many great artists uh, of the 20th century, uh, Motherwell and, and people like that. I mean, people you don't normally uh, put in the same category as, as Hirschfeld. He did uh, Alexander Calder prints and all kinds of things. Um, and so this print, in some ways, is a great sort of snapshot of Hirschfeld himself. So uh, on one side you have... Um, I'm sorry. Can everyone hear me? We're in, okay, fantastic. Uh, so Sinatra, 1981, he had been drawing Sinatra for 40 years at this point. His first drawing was for a CBS uh, radio postcard. Uh, and he thought that, at, uh, at that time, he thought Sinatra was just a fad. You know, that he was a Bobby Soxer and he had been through so many other music fads. He, uh, Al liked him, but didn't think he would actually be around for m much longer than the fad lasted. 
Um, and he, the next drawing he did was for uh, Seventeen magazine in 1946. And he started, draw he, drew he drew Sinatra 45 times. Sinatra so liked Hirschfeld's work, he, he said that I in the 40s and 50s, there was no artist who better represented New York than Al Hirschfeld. And uh, in fact, when uh, he started making films through United Artists, started producing his own films, he started working on a film in, the, the, in February 1962, and he called up Al and said, come on out, I think you'll enjoy this film that I'm making. So Al, who did not fly, he had something in his inner ear that stopped him from flying, took a train out to uh, Hollywood and sat on the set with Sinatra and the stars of the film that he was making, which turned out to be The Manchurian Candidate. And Al ended up doing two drawings. Uh, he did the first drawing was of uh, the cast and crew s sitting around a table listening to a radio. It was John Glenn circling the uh, Earth in the first, uh, you know, uh, space voyage. And, uh, and then he did, he did a later drawing, th and that drawing appeared before the film came out. That was in sort of pre-publicity, like this film is being made. And then he did another drawing that's classic Hirschfeld, that shows you all this action of the film, but doesn't tell you any of the plot. Um, it's a wonderful drawing. Uh, of course, he'd been drawing Angela Lansbury at this point for about 25 years he, when she started in MGM films. Um, he, he had been drawing her. Lawrence Harvey, he'd drawn in a lot of uh, United Artists pictures because as MGM dissolved in the um, late 40s, uh, he, uh, Al hooked up with United Artists. Um, the movies is actually where Hirschfeld got his start. Um, his career starts in 1920. Hirschfeld himself starts in 1903 in St. Louis, where uh, a local artist, he, where, where Hirschfeld himself said that he, at a very young age, contracted a sickness uh, for drawing. And uh, a local artist mentored him and took him on sketching trips around St. Louis and came to his parents and said, this boy is too good to leave in St. Louis. You must take him to New York. And based on that, they took him to New York. They took the whole family. They sold their home. They took a train to New York. Then they took uh, a streetcar out to the end of the line, which was Washington Heights. And they walked through several farm fields. This is 1914. And they rented a house for $4 uh, a month, a second floor of a house for $4 a month. And Al became a New Yorker. He took classes at the National Academy of Design, where he learned, he said, the only things that you can teach an artist, which are anatomy and perspective, which the rules of which Al would break for the rest of his career. Uh, but at that time, he was very studious. He wanted to be a sculptor. Uh, and he was going to a vo uh, vocational school at the same time. And he had to serve an apprenticeship. And he thought he would go down to uh, Union Square. They had these architectural um, uh, decorative sculpture um, factories, really. You know, so if you wanted cherubs or florets on your building or some, you know, bas relief, these are the places that you went. Uh, and Al saw it and saw these guys were really quite good at what they did, but he thought the atmosphere was terrible. He couldn't imagine spending his life there. And uh, he would later come to the realization that sculpture was just a drawing you could trip over in the dark. Uh, and, uh, but it, he's walking down Fifth Avenue wondering what he's going to do, and he runs into a, 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 not only a classmate but a teammate. Al was playing on a semi-pro baseball team with, among other people, Lou Gehrig. Uh, and, uh, but one of his other teammates was a fellow by the name of Howard Simon, and uh, Simon was also a classmate at this vocational school, and he said, Howard, where are you doing your apprenticeship? And he says, oh, Al, I got a job at, uh, at Goldwyn Pictures. I'm a gopher there, and uh, they, I run errands, and I clean brushes, and I get to watch movies, and Al got very excited. It sounded like a great job, and, but he's, Howard said, look, Al, but don't go there. There's, they don't have any more uh, jobs. Well, Hirschfeld was so naive. He was 16, 17 years old. He went down to Goldwyn Pictures. This was at, uh, on 42nd Street, right across the street from uh, um, uh, the New York Public Library. And uh, he went into the publicity director's office, who was Howard Dietz, uh, who would later become a great songwriter and producer and director. Um, and Dietz hired him as a gopher for $4 a week. Uh, and Al cleaned brushes and ran errands. But Al being Al couldn't stop himself from drawing. And he would do drawings and uh, then throw them in the trash can. One night, Dietz fished out one of these drawings out of the waste paper basket and thought it was good enough to run, and Al's first drawing appeared. We don't know what that was, but uh, it was a, a drawing of one of Goldwyn's stars. And every once in a while, they let uh, Al do uh, some drawings. Uh, he, did the, um, he did publicity drawings for the American release of The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 1921. 
and uh, he thought, Al thought this was great, you know, do, getting paid to do drawings every once in a while, and he still ran errands and he cleaned brushes. Uh, he went away with his family on vacation. He asked that his job be held until he came back, but when he came back from vacation, the job had been filled, and he went in to, s to see Dietz and said, Howard, I thought you were going to keep my job. He's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get rid of this guy. You can have your job back. Well, Al didn't want to see another, even at 17 years old, he didn't want to see another fellow lose his job. And so he took the few drawings that he had already had published and literally went down the street to Universal and got hired as an artist uh, there for $75 a week. And that's really the start of Al's career doing uh, uh, as a published artist. Um, he worked there for a while but did not like the art director and started doing freelance for different studios. One of them was Selznick Pictures. This wasn't David Selznick, this was David Selznick's father. Um, it was not the biggest studio, but it had the biggest advertising budget. They had the largest billboards in Times Square. Um, David Selznick and Al were the same age. They hit it off, and David convinced his father that uh, they should hire Al, all of 18 years old, as the art director for Selznick Pictures. He was hired. Uh, he got a brownstone at where the Museum of Modern Art stands today, and he hired a stable of artists and they churned out all kinds of uh, uh, promotional material. This is a front cover of a 12-page insert in the Saturday Evening Post, at that time the largest advertising buy in a national publication. And inside was a tour de force of Hirschfeld. Although he had all these other artists, I think this was so important that he wanted to do it himself. And he did, the, he did that crazy psychedelic cover. That's Hirschfeld. I found the original artwork in his studio. And when I found it, you know, Al's, the big thing that I always heard from Al was, where did you find that? And then he looked at it and he's like, how did I do this piece? You know, he, he was so foreign to him. But on the inside, as you look at it, um, you know, this spread here is a perfect example. These are very, th this is the style of drawing that he was doing. It's 1924 at this point. He is uh, 20, 21 years old. Uh, and uh, he's doing drawings that are great drawings, but let's face it, these drawings could have been done 100 years earlier. You know, classic representational drawings. Uh, the painting is probably the most interesting part here because that's also by Hirschfeld, and that uses the fadeaway technique, popularized by Cole Phillips, who was a great illustrator of the period, where he let the background do, uh, provide a lot of information for the artwork. We don't see what the fellow is wearing, but, uh, and it's hard to see at this, uh, um, at this size, but there's no information about what he's wearing, yet we can tell exactly what he's wearing because the black sort of fills in all the information. Well, that's something that Hirschfeld would use a great deal of throughout his career. Um, where the white of the board supplies so much of what we, what's not there, but what we see. You know, John Russell one time said that Al made the white of the board act as his henchman and friend because so much of the drawing was, was just white. Um, well, so Al's doing this very conventional work, but the world of uh, illustration and art is moving much faster than this. Modernism is, uh, uh, you know, if you want to be a a popular publication. You're do using caricature, you're using abstract design, and Al was sort of, you know, being left behind. Best thing that ever happened to him is Selznick went bankrupt. And uh, although Al was left holding the bag, you know, for bills to his uh, fellow artists and his suppliers and whatnot, he could have walked away, but that wasn't Hirschfeld's uh, um, uh, style. So he goes to a party one night at Carl Van Vechten's, and uh, he's 20 years old. He meets a, a, a young artist who's just come from Mexico, 19 years old, by the name of Miguel Covarrubias. Covarrubias is a natural graphic artist, has assimilated the whole graphic tradition of Mexico, and had come to New York with a letter of introduction to, to Van Vechten. And uh, Van Vechten, in the first week in New York, recognizes that he's a great caricaturist and takes him around to uh, Eva Le Gallion, Irving Berlin, uh, Alfred Knopf, and most importantly, Frank Crowenshield. And Crowenshield, who's the editor of Vanity Fair, recognizes that right away Cove Rubies is a remarkable artist and would soon hire him very frequently to do artwork for a lot of Condé Nast uh, uh, publications. And in, in, in the process, Cove Rubies would become the go-to characters of the late 1920s. But it w uh, on this night, he's just gotten to New York. Uh, he's not, as I said, he's 19 years old. Hirschfeld is sort of at loose ends. He knows he's going to start working for other uh, studios uh, to pay his bills, and they need a studio to work in. They hit it off at this party, 
and they decide to get a studio together. And it's in that studio, first on 110 West 42nd Street, and then over at the American Radiator Building on 40th, that Hirschfeld get really gets introduced to caricature. A lot of, uh, and in Al's own words, he said a lot of what Covarrubias had brought uh, to America rolled off on Hirschfeld. And in April 1925, the first Hirschfeld caricature, in fact, on this day, 91 years ago, the very first Hirschfeld caricature is published, and not in the New York Times, and not of theater. It's in the New York world, and it's for two Warner Brothers films. It's uh, Sidney Chaplin, uh, Charlie Chaplin's brother, in a film called Man in the Box, and Irene Rich in My Wife and I. And if he had just done this style of caricature, none of us would be here today. Um, but this is the start of uh, Hirschfeld. He hasn't given up uh, traditional uh, drawing yet. He's doing both kinds of work for Warner Brothers and for other uh, um, advertisements, other studios. He's now working, although he's doing primarily work for Warner Brothers, he's still working with three or four other studios because Al loved to draw. And uh, he spends the next 18 months doing a combination of caricature and straight drawing. And all of this is being done as he said, to pay the room rent, because he was actually a, 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 a painter. He was a studio artist. And he was doing this to pay the bills, it beat going to an office every day. Um, and he was becoming quite accomplished in his uh, painting. And so when he paid off all of his debts, an uncle gives him $500 to go to Paris to uh, study art. And Al's going to go there to, to get rid of the commercial side of his work. And uh, he goes to Paris. Uh, and has a life-changing experience uh, because he said there a whole new world opened to him. And although his first night there was a disaster and he thought he was going to leave the first night, by morning he had signed an eight-year lease on a studio with two Englishmen he had met that night. One of them was Roger First, who would be, uh, was Roger First who would become uh, Olivier's great set designer at the National Theater. Um, well, uh, while he's there, I, I asked Al why Paris? And you know, in the 1920s, why did everybody go there? And he said, because it was cheap. You could live for pennies a day. His, his yearly rent on his studio was $33, and that was split three ways. Um, so uh, Al lived like a king in Paris, and when he would start running low on money, he said he would go back to New York to add to his con uh, collection of contemporary money. And he did that with assignments from film studios. He came back. He was, everyone liked him. He was a great, he had a great personality. He was a very, very fun individual to be with. And uh, from a young age all the way up to the very end of his life. Um, and uh, so he'd get these assignments from film studios. He'd make some money and then go back to Paris. Well, in December 1926, he's in New York. And he runs into a friend of his who's just uh, starting as a, uh, his own press agent, uh, his own press uh, business, uh, PR business. He had been, a, his name was Richard Maney. He would go on to become the, the dean of Broadway press agents. And Maney's promoting his first show, and he invites Al to come along with him to a performance. It's uh, the French actor uh, Sacha Guitry uh, in a play that he's written about Mozart. Al, being Al, is watching the show and doodles a likeness of Guitry on his program. Maney sees it and says, Al, if you put that on a clean sheet of paper, I can get one of the newspapers to run it. Al does do that, and the next week, Six columns wide, there are eight columns in a newspaper page. Six columns wide, the whole top of the fold is this drawing of Sacha Guitry. This is the start of Al's theatrical career. For the next 76 years, as I said, almost every Sunday or every other Sunday, there would be a Hirschfeld drawing almost always of the theater. Now, for, films, uh, for film studios, he was still doing representational work, straight drawing and caricature. For the newspapers, he never did anything but caricature. Um, so this was for the Herald Tribune. He thought it was a one-off until he got a telegram the next week asking for another drawing. He would contribute to that paper for 20 years. Uh, in 1928, he gets a telegram, January 1928, he gets a telegram from uh, Zolotow at the New York Times asking for a two-column drawing of Sir Harry Lauder, a Scottish vaudevillian who was, one of, he was making one of his regular farewell tours. And, uh, Al went to it, did this drawing. It appeared uh, in the New York Times on January 29th, uh, 1928. And that was the start of his relationship with the Times. He would become embarrassed by this drawing uh, when he did his first collection of uh, theater drawings in 1960 called American Theater, as seen by Hirschfeld. Uh, he broke it up by uh, decades. And instead of showing this drawing as his first drawing for the Times, he showed this drawing from 1930, which he thought was a much better drawing. 
When I confronted him with this information, he claimed he had lost the clipping of the first drawing, and I think it was Al's way of not, uh, he was embarrassed by it. He, did, he didn't want to see it. And much to his chagrin, he liked having an archivist, but he didn't like an archivist who, who showed all of the bad drawings he did. Uh, one of the first projects I did with him was a book for Scribner's, where it was a career overview, and he was saying, oh, we don't need any drawings from the 20s. And I said, Al, nobody's ever seen that work before. And uh, I said, we don't really need the recent drawings. Everybody's seen those. But by the end of the project, I realized that he was drawing better than he'd ever drawn before. And when we looked at the first galley, it was, it was kind of funny because I was like, oh, gosh, maybe, maybe we can ask him to hold on. We'll get a few more recent drawings. So, you know, he'd, he was just producing one great drawing after another. And he was saying, gosh, do you think we can get more drawings from the 20s? You know, because he had realized that this was really showing the evolution of his whole work. Um, but so he, uh, uh, he starts doing this theater work. Um, he ends up in three New York newspapers. By 1928, he's in, th he's in the paper literally every Sunday, sometimes two or three papers every Sunday for the next five years. You could not go to New York and pick up one of the 14 newspapers, really, and not see a Hirschfeld drawing. Eventually, by, in 1943, a, a, a New York Times editor actually says this to Al. He says, I pick up the Sunday papers, and I don't know which one I'm reading because they all have your drawings. And he said, what can we do to get you exclusive to the New York Times for New York papers? And Al said, cross my palm with silver, and I'm your man. Uh, he liked the Times the best because they gave him assignments, but they didn't tell him what to do. And uh, they paid him directly, whereas the other newspapers, you would get paid by the press agent for the show. And the incentive to do great work was you would get paid by the column inch, 10 to $15 per column inch. So Al being Al, he was a complete prankster. Sometimes he would do drawings that would end in a point. And so the last two columns would just be a point with nothing in it. And uh, he would make them pay because, you know, if these were all friends of his. All the press agents were friends of his. And they knew they had been uh, taken, but they couldn't say that, it, you know, he didn't earn it. Uh, so, Al's, uh, in 1928 is also a big year for Al because he marries a showgirl from Earl Cowell's Vanities and uh, they honeymoon in Moscow for five months. He gets made an international correspondent for the Herald Tribune. He interviews all the heads of the Russian theater and film scene at that time for a book that Bonet and Liberwright were going to publish. Um, he sent back illustrated articles uh, with Stanislavski and Eisenstein. Um, I mean, he has unbelievable access to everybody. And uh, at that time, the Russian theater and film scene is at its apex. It would never be greater than this period. And Al did this wonderful illustrated book, which he brought back to America, gave to Bonet and Leverite, and who promptly lost the entire manuscript and all the drawings. Uh, it's the one th time in I'd ever saw regret pass over Al Hirschfeld's face. We were talking about this, and he's telling me the story. And it's the great lost manuscript. He hadn't thought to make a copy of anything because he didn't think he would need to make a copy of anything. And the only drawings that survived were these ones he had sent back to the newspaper and uh, went with instructions that after they were published, they were to be sent over to Dave's Blue Room, which was a showbiz hangout. Um, and uh, they hung caricatures on the wall, just like Sardi's, which started at the same time, uh, did, because that's what the Paris cafes did. I'm going to just move to the side here because the sun's in my eye. Oh, excuse me. Oh my God, that is worse. Oh, I'm perfect. Can you hear me? Do I need the microphone? Okay, perfect. Okay, sunglasses. I have some sunglasses in my face. <laughs> well, in any event, I'm never going to tell any of the story because we're only in 1928. Okay. God. Uh, in any event. Uh, so, uh, although that was the great lost manuscript, it didn't slow down Hirschfeld. Um, he, he came back to America, and while he had an audience in the tens of thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands, with his newspaper work, that was not the biggest audience he had. The biggest audience he had was the work he was doing for the movie studios. In 1927, he agrees to a uh, $15,000 uh, a year guarantee with uh, MGM. They still paid $35 or $50 a drawing, but they guaranteed him $15,000 worth of work uh, in a year, and he said they always went over. 
and he said he loved the work because it was completely open-ended. You could do, essentially do whatever you wanted. It was like the internet of the 1990s. You know, nobody really knew what they were doing making films, but they were just making a lot of them. And, uh, and, and of course, they were great personalities. Law and Hardy uh, signed to MGM at the same time, and their first eight feature films for uh, MGM all have Hirschfeld posters. And when I say uh, posters, each film had at least six different posters, ranging from a uh, one sheet, which is your traditional size poster, to a 24 sheet that covered the sides of a building. And the way we view Law and Hardy today is as much a product of Al Hirschfeld as it is Law and Hardy. Uh, when I was talking to Al about Law and Hardy, uh, he said, well, you know, they always look like the number 10 to me. Uh, and those posters really help define their personalities. Um, and I really think it's in the posters that Hirschfeld became Hirschfeld, because while in the newspaper you could add a lot of information, because it was intended to be read, you read a newspaper. A movie poster, you had to get everything about what it was trying to do as you passed by the theater on the bus. And so you had to make every line count, and you had to make it bold and uh, 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 just really capture the character as quickly as possible, because that's all the time that you had. You had this short interval to sort of make the case for the film. And I really think, uh, and, and Hirschfeld as a, at this time was much more of a movie, a film art artist than he was a newspaper artist. The newspaper work paid little compared to what the, the film studios paid. And uh, in 1931, uh, so the, when, the, when the stock market crash uh, happens, Al's not very much affected because he's working for six different studios and three different newspapers. He's doing book covers. Um, and although album covers hadn't been invented yet, that would wait until 1938. As I said, when they start coming out, Al's there. Um, so he's doing very well. The stock market crash happens. The depression starts. And by, the, by late 1931, Al is depressed by the depression and wants to go someplace and paint. You know, he's still doing this to pay for uh, his uh, studio painting. He's had exhibitions in New York, Paris, Chicago, um, St. Louis. Uh, museums have started to collect his work. Uh, collectors weren't uh, avoiding him nearly as much as they used to. Uh, and he had a successful career sort of staring him in the face. And so he just, he'd read Nordoff and Hull, Muni on the Bounty, and decides to go to Tahiti to paint. And when he gets there, he's appalled at what he finds. It's a completely uh, phony culture. Uh, he thought it was Im imported from central casting in Hollywood. The uh, natives are playing Irving Berlin songs on ukuleles. And he hates it. it, it to him, it's, it's such a phony culture that uh, uh, he wants to leave right away. The boat only comes once a month. Um, he writes a letter to his friend Covarubius, who's had the same idea, but he and his wife go to Bali the island of Bali. Al writes these misanthropic letters to Covarubias telling him how terrible Tahiti is. Covarubias writes back and says how wonderful Bali is. And he decides he's going to write a book about it. In fact, it's still a primary text on the island. And uh, he, he got a Guggenheim Fellowship and came back to Bali. Before he leaves, he says to Al, if you can get here, I'll leave my house, my dishes, my bicycle. And Al says, I'm on my way. And he trades a painting to a ship captain and by way of Australian and Madagascar ends up on the island of Bali. And when he walks into the village of Denpasar, the sun is so bright, it bleaches out all the colors and all he sees are black and white line drawings walking around. And he says then it was, it was there that his love affair with line really began. And he continued to paint. He was, uh, he was doing wonderful watercolors. And, uh, um, but he saw these as drawings that had color with them. Uh, he was fascinated by the shadow puppets, uh, who could convey so much emotion and character, even though um, you know there was just outlines. You know he could see what line and and light and shadow could do. Uh, Al thought that great graphic art came from wherever there were pyramids. You know, with the the you know the, he he wasn't surprised that great painting came from Europe, where you had rain and lush colors and things like that, and clouds. Whereas great graphic art came from places like Bali and Mexico and the Far East, when it was so much drier and there was and the sun was so much brighter. Um, so he's in Bali, and. Uh, um, only Al could be on an island, a tropical island, uh, with only three other Westerners, one of them being his wife, and no electricity, and end up having dinner with Charlie Chaplin, the most famous entertainer of the, in the world at that time. Um, Chaplin had come to Bali on a round-the-world cruise with his brother, Sidney. Um, Al had sent a, letter, a note to them inviting him to his house for dinner, even though he didn't know him. 
uh, he, uh, uh, he loved his pictures and liked him. Chaplin never had met Al, but knew of him be, uh, because in 1927, Al had done posters for the uh, Pathé re-releases of his films. And of course, Chaplin would have seen the posters that Al had done for all of Chaplin's contemporaries, friends, and rivals. You know, because he did posters for Buster Keaton, Lowell and Hardy, Charlie Chase. Um, and of course, uh, Chaplin would have been in New York on some weekend uh, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, and he couldn't help but see Al's drawings uh, in the newspapers. So he accepted the invitation. Well, Al had laid out a whole feast, a gamelan orchestra. There was a big fire, and girls get up to dance. And when they sit down from dancing, Chaplin gets up and recreates their dance. He loves it because nobody in Bali knows who Charlie Chaplin is. And he experiments, uh, uh, he does gags because he wants to see if people will laugh because it's funny or because he's Charlie Chaplin. Well, since no one knows who Chaplin is, they're laughing at what he's doing. And he so, he so falls in love with this, this culture that, that Al, too, had fallen in love with that he gets off the Around the World cruise and moves in with the Hirschfelds. They had a little compound. There was a little hut at the back of the property, and Charlie and Sidney Chaplin move in with the Hirschfelds. They're there for two weeks until Charlie gets dysentery and has to go to the mainland to get uh, medical attention. Before he leaves, he buys all of Al's watercolors of Bali, and uh, it's that money that allows Hirschfeld to get back to New York. Uh, once back in New York, uh, Al discovers that the bright spotlight on Broadway can replace the bright sunlight of Bali. And so we have a drawing like this of uh, Fanny Bryce and, and uh, George Jessel on the, at the, on the stage at uh, Param the Paramount Theater. And uh, I love it be because for years, by the way, I had, u I had a newspaper clipping of this. And when I would tell the, the story about uh, the change in uh, what, where his bright light was coming from, I would show this image, never thinking that I'd ever find the original drawing. Until about, about a year ago, I got a call from a gallery on Madison Avenue. Um, could I come and identify what they have? And thinking it was going to be a print or some obvious piece, I went there, it took me a couple of weeks to get over there, I get there, and they bring out this drawing. And I, my jaw dropped, and I tell them the whole story, and uh, you know, what the significance of this drawing is, and they're just lapping it up, and I finish, and they look at me, and they said, how much is it worth? You know, that was the only thing they really cared about. Well, it was, I said, if you get less than $30,000, you're giving it away. And they sold it the next week uh, for over that. Um, it was it, it was a remarkable piece. We had it in the New York Historical Society show. But, you know, here he's arranged um, these performers like shadow puppets. I mean, it's a direct. I mean, Al was so taken with shadow puppets, he brought home a whole, a whole collection of them. And uh, on his brownstone on 95th Street, as you walked up the stairs, there were all these shadow puppets up the stairs, and he had them in the studio. He loved them. You know, the, Brooks Atkinson said that one of the reasons he loved them was because it captured sort of this childlike view of the world. And Al was very much this, in, in, in his whole life, really had this wide-eyed wonder uh, of whatever he saw. You know, it, when it, I remember when he saw the, la the seventh revival of Showboat in his lifetime, and I was having lunch with him the next day. I have the record for the most free lunches at the home of Al Hirschfeld. And uh, we were having lunch, and he, I knew he had been to the opening the night before, and I said, well, how was it? Thinking that he would say, oh, it's not as good as 46 or the one in 55 or, you know. And he talked about it as if he had never seen it before. And I realized then that for him, each, each time he went to the theater was a brand new experience. That it was, he, when the lights went down, he was as excited as he was at 15 when he saw his first Broadway show, which was Hijinks, as he was at, you know, 95. He, he, he never lost that capacity for amazement and wonder. And that was the story of his whole life. We, he could go down to the corner and come back and have a fascinating story to tell. William Saroyan, who was a friend of his, said that wherever Al went, somebody was always offering the key to something. And he just had this sort of natural charisma. And uh, his drawings, in, in that way, are a very accurate reflection of who he, who he was. He was this guy who, on the face of it, might seem like simple, but the more time you spent with him, the more insightful it became. And you realized the, how witty he was and how just interesting he was. And although I was 23 when I first met him and he was 86, we never talked to each other as anything other than peers. And, you know, uh, uh, that wasn't due to me. That was very much due to Hirschfeld. He got along with everybody. Uh, and, uh, you know, he drew the vainest people in the world.
and nobody complained. They all looked forward to it. And so, of course, you know, he, and who did he draw? He drew everybody. It's a much shorter list to say who he didn't draw. Um, and uh, he knew uh, when he got back from Bali, he gives up painting altogether, and he realized he's, he's really focused on uh, image and pure line, and he knows he's getting good in 1935 when he says, the people started to look like my drawings rather than the other way around. <laughs> And the best example of this is the Marx Brothers. Um, you know, they had been on stage in vaudeville and on Broadway for 25 years before Al drew them, and even longer, 30 years. And you see drawings of them from the early part of their career, and they're all over the place. They don't always look like the Marx Brothers as we know the Marx Brothers. Um, when Al drew the Marx Brothers, after that, everybody's drawings look like Al's. Uh, and, in fact, the Marx Brothers themselves started to look like his drawings. Um, those two triangles of hair that Al gave him in his drawings, well, the MGM uh, costume department tried to get Groucho's hair in their second film for MGM, A Day at the Races, to look like uh, those two triangles. You know, uh, they tried to conform to Al's idea of them. Um, and uh, they were exactly, they, he loved performers like that. You know, crazy people, larger than life characters. They were easy to draw because they were caricatures already. All Al had to do was transcribe them. Um, but 10 years later, 1945, uh, a, a, a new set of playwrights come on, this, uh, on the scene in, in, on Broadway. Arthur Miller, uh, Tennessee Williams, William Ng. This drawing that appeared on March 25, 1945, to me, captures the whole transition of the American theater. On the left side, classic theater experience with Catherine Cornell and Brian O'Hearn in the Barretts of Wimpole Street, uh, a play about uh, Elizabeth uh, Barrett Browning and Robert Browning. Um, Catherine Cornell was a great stage star. Uh, some of you might know who she is. She never really made movies, but People went to see her in, in all of her shows for 25 years. You did not go because she was in a great place. Barrett's and Wimpole Street, she revived three times on Broadway. It's never been revived since. You never hear of anybody doing a production of it because it's not a very good play. Okay, but people went to see it. They would see it repeatedly with Catherine Cornell because Cornell was such a stage presence that uh, you went to, that's what Broadway was at that time. You went to see the performers rather than the plays themselves. Um, and here's this classic theater experience on the left-hand side. I mean, again, this could have been Shakespeare or something like that. And these flowing lines of the curtains hit a brick wall. And that is the tenement wall outside uh, uh, the Wingfield's home in the Broadway premiere of The Glass Menagerie. Now, if you can find a more meek character than Laura Wingfield in Broadway characters, I will give you uh, a dollar. I mean, there is almost nobody more meek. And for, some, for a caricaturist, a meek uh, uh, character who who's does nothing to attract attention to herself, who's played like that by a performer who wants to sublimate herself into the role, that should have been the end of Al's career because there's nothing to caricature there. But because Al really wasn't doing caricature, there was as much character there as it was uh, as the Marx Brothers, or as Catherine Cornell, or as Mae West. Everybody had character. Every one of us here. He drew civilians, believe it or not. And those drawings are as engaging as his drawings of Carol Channing and Zero Mostel, because for him, they were great drawings. That's what Al was interested in. After a while, the subject matter, we, we think a great deal about the subject matter, but for Al, they were just people. And he was much more interested in the drawing. He wanted to create a drawing that withstood the test of time, that withstood its topical news value. That uh, um, I compare it to Toulouse Lautrec's drawings of Jane Avril. We all know those great images and those posters. And I'm sure people at that time said, boy, he really got her. I, I've seen her perform in the Paris nightclubs and the cabarets, and he really captured her. But of course, none of us look at those drawings today and think of them for their documentary nature. We think of them for their aesthetic nature. And that's what's happening today with Hirschfeld's work. And it's why it's finding an audience that you wouldn't expect to find. Um, peop uh, um, collectors, for instance, who are under the age of 35 react to the drawing rather than to the subject matter. Um, we were just out in California, and we did a, a, a short s show and sale, and we got prices for his work that have never been gotten before.
And we're seeing that more and more, that galleries are, are, are finding his work is reaching an audience that, they, that is beyond the people who say, oh, Catherine Hepburn, I loved her in this, and, and, and she's great in that. Because most of us uh, are of an age where when we look at those drawings of, say, uh, well, Richard Kiley and Man of La Mancha, you remember the score, you remember maybe you saw a production, maybe you were in a production, and we bring all that to the piece. And sometimes that clouds our view of what we're looking at, okay? But for a younger audience who maybe never heard of Man of La Mancha, probably never heard of Richard Kiley, um, they just see a great drawing. You know, that this, uh, the drawing of Richard Kiley and Man of La Mancha is in the Harvard Theater Collection, which, believe it or not, is the largest public collection of Hirschfeld's work. Um, in 1977, when this drawing appeared, um, the curator of uh, drawings at Harvard at the Fogg Museum in Harvard, wrote to her superior and said, we've got to find somebody to buy this drawing for us. I don't see how he could be better than this. And they found a, 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 an alumni who did buy it for them and who fell in love with Al's work. And over the next 25 years, collected over 100 pieces, sketchbooks, ephemera, posters, prints, all kinds of things to create this incredible collection of Al's work. He recognized it very clearly. Um, it's why the, a, a, and the National Portrait Gallery collects Al's work because he's a great portrait artist. The Library of Congress collects uh, Al's work because it's great art, it's great portraits, it's a, it's a record of our popular culture of our age. It's all those things. So to get back to this piece of, um, uh, of uh, Sinatra and Pavarotti, so in this one piece, you get uh, Sinatra, who, as I said, Al not only drew 45 times, but knew quite well, and Sinatra knew him. He was bringing that to the table. Uh, and then Pavarotti was exa exactly the kind of character Al liked to draw. As he said, he loved the characters who didn't close a door, they slammed it. You know, and Pavarotti was exactly that. An opera star is, although Al did not draw too much I in the way of opera, his uh, longest period is um, 1977 to 1987. He did, a, he did drawings of all the Texaco broadcast of, uh, the, Met bro of the Metropolitan Opera. Wonderful uh, diary of the Metropolitan Opera at that time. And, it had, and was very fortunate to have sort of these great uh, operatic stars, divas and, uh, you know, People like Pavarotti, he, he drew many, many times. This is La Boheme, this is one of the Texaco drawings. And he would draw Pavarotti for the rest of his career. Um, so in this one piece, you get the sense of not only uh, two worlds brought together, uh, um, uh, two figures that Al loved to draw, um, a print that was, uh, uh, the printmaker was, you know, Al did the initial drawing and it was Serini who transferred it into an etching. Um, which Al uh, worked with him on and uh, went through the whole printing process. They hand signed it, they numbered it. They're very small editions. I think uh, this may be 100 in the edition. Um, and it, not surprisingly, they, they, have, they, keep on they keep appreciating and value in the marketplace. Um, for Al, that was a happy byproduct of what he did. He loved to draw and he was felt fortunate there was always somebody who wanted something to be drawn. Um, and he would draw up into the very last day of his life. Al lived to be 99 and a half, and uh, he was exactly the way he was when he was 29 and a half. Okay, the only difference, as one of his friends told me, is that his hair was white when he was 99 and a half. He went out every night or had people in virtually every night of his life. Okay, he was working on a drawing the day before he died. It's, it's actually, as fate would have it, it happened to be a, uh, uh, somebody had commissioned him to do a drawing of the Marx Brothers. And so here he was, you know, 65 years or a little bit more when he, from the time he first drew the Marx Brothers and he was doing another drawing on the Marx Brothers. And he didn't feel well. And uh, the only time I can remember in the 13 years that I know him, he, he went to bed in the middle of the day. He had a great worth, work ethic. He went to work every day, worked all day, and then went out all night. I mean, that's who, uh, Al complained to me that uh, he was upset that nobody liked to stay up as long as he did, uh, you know, as he got older in life. Not just his contemporaries, but younger people. Al ended up reading a lot more in his later years because from two to four in the morning, say, there was nobody to hang out with, so he, st he read more. 
Um, and so when I called up the house uh, on January 19th, 2003, and his wife said to me, oh, Al's not feeling well, he's in bed, I was shocked. I mean, I'd, I'd never... Uh, I'd never heard of that before. Uh, we talked frequently on the phone, and we, of course I saw him every week, and uh, I didn't think much about it. Although he was 99 and a half, the idea that Al Hirschfeld might die did not enter the picture. He, wa he seemed to be immune from time. And, uh, but uh, indeed, he was wh what would be his deathbed, drifting in and out of consciousness. Uh, his wife told me later that uh, um, at one point he sort of regains consciousness and starts drawing in the air. And she says, Al, what are you doing? And he says, I'm practicing my perspective. So all the way to the end, he's still drawing. Uh, and uh, he drifts off to sleep and, and passes away on January 20th. Of course, there were tributes all over the world, front page of the New York Times, as you can imagine. Um, they lowered the lights on Broadway, uh, you know, all the things that you would expect. Um, there, had, there was nobody alive on Broadway who had grown up in a world without Al Hirschfeld. Okay, Hirschfeld saw more theater in America than anybody else in the 20th century. Because not only did he, see, not only did he go to all the first nights in his whole career, 76 year career uh, on Broadway, but uh, he would often see the sh those shows in out of town tryouts where he made his initial sketches before he, and completing the drawing in his studio. And, uh, um, so it was, it was a new world for everybody. Fortunately, before he had died, um, his wife and Arthur Galvin, the New York Times, had gone to Rocco Landisman and said, you know, Al's going to be 100 in June. It would be so great if there could be a theater name for him, because who's more associated uh, with, with Broadway? You know, uh, we, the right, I, I next month, uh, there's going to be a show in St. Louis uh, of Hirschfeld drawing um, Tennessee Williams. And arguably, Tennessee Williams is really one of the great playwrights of, the, of our times. Uh, somewhere tonight, someone's doing Streetcar and or Glass Menagerie, uh, um, and maybe some of the other plays, Night of the Iguana, Rose Tattoo, um, things like that. But his career, his active career on Broadway was only 15 years. And then he went into a very steep decline, and it went on for years. Al was reaching an audience of the millions when he was 25, and he only got more popular, and he only got better. Because as you look at the work, he just keeps on, he, he doesn't do the same thing. Uh, as I often say, the downside of ubiquity, because there was no more ubiquitous artist than Al Hirschfeld in the 20th century. Um, uh, the downside of ubiquity is you cannot repeat yourself. Because if you start repeating yourself, you're not going to, no one's going to call you because they don't want last week's drawing or last year's drawing. They want a fresh drawing. And it's that idea that he's always making a new drawing that he's not repeating himself, that we can look at his drawings today and they don't seem to be of a certain time. They record a certain time, but you don't look at them and say, boy, that's 1944 or that's so 1930s. Some of the early work is much more design oriented than character oriented, and that's very easy to uh, see that it's done at that time period. But the later work is, is, is timeless. Um, and when I say the later work, probably from the 1940s on. Uh, so uh, you can go to, uh, Al Hirschfeld's still on Broadway. Tonight the marquee's lit in front of the uh, Al Hirschfeld Theater on 45th and uh, 9th Avenue. It's a self-portrait of Hirschfeld dipping a pen into an inkwell in his head. And uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. He's, he's like the eternal flame of Broadway. Well, thank you. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yes. Sure. Um, well, that hurt, that, uh, so what is his connection to Bucks County? Uh, he has a long connection to Bucks County. In fact, almost moved here twice. Uh, one time, uh, he, uh, S.J. Perlman wanted, the, he and S.J. Perlman were great friends, and uh, Perlman found a great place for him to move to, and uh, brought Al down, and Al thought the place needed too much work, and he didn't want to do it. And uh, so when Hirschfeld left, Perlman called the next person on his list, which was Dorothy Parker. And Dorothy Parker bought the house and did, painted the living room in 10 shades of red and caused a great deal of consternation of her neighbors. Um, and then he was going to build a house on the uh, sort of the cliffs on the other side of the bridge from Frenchtown. Uh, and uh, an architect said he could build this fabulous house for $10,000. This is in the mid-50s. 
um, and it turns out you couldn't. Uh, and so he, he gave up the property. But in 1939, on July 1st, uh, 1939, he came down to uh, New Hope to cover the opening of the Bucks County Playhouse. Al would spend a lot of his summers, uh, theater, you know, Broadway closed up in the, in, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, Broadway sort of closed for the summer because they didn't have air conditioning. And the stars would go out on the road and do sort of their favorite plays for one week or two week stints at summer theaters, uh, what was called the Straw Hat Trail from Vermont to Virginia. Um, and Al would go to these different theaters and often include different scenes of what was happening and sometimes a map of how many miles it was from Times Square. But he goes to the opening of uh, the Bucks County Playhouse and does this wonderful drawing that appears on all across eight columns on the front page of the New York Times drama section the following week. And uh, Beatrice Kaufman, the woman in st st looking straight at you on the lower right, uh, who was the wife of George Kaufman and quite a force in her own uh, way, um, in, you know, uh, uh, individually, um, demanded that Hirschfeld be uh, fired from the paper because she thought the portrait of her was horrible. <laughs> and uh, luckily for Al, uh, cooler heads prevailed because the drawing looked just like her. Um, he would come down, um, there's a wonderful drawing of him uh, uh, going to a, uh, uh, a rehearsal. Uh, George Kaufman's directing a rehearsal of a Harold Rome musical called Pretty Penny that was on its way to Broadway, but alas, lost its way, never made it there. Um, he did come to the music circus. I mean, he was a stone's throw from where we are right now uh, and did this wonderful drawing of the music circus. It's a little hard to see. At, at this uh, level, but uh, it's a great one, capturing you know sort of the the round uh, that was such a classic part of the music circus. So there's he loved coming out here. The last time he saw a show at the Playhouse, uh, well the last one that he drew was um, the beauty part, S. J. Perlman's the beauty part with Bert Lahr. Um, and as Al told me, he was driving back to New York with his wife, and uh, he turned to his wife and said, wow, that was a great play. Who wrote the music? And Dolly said, music? There's no music in that. And Al realized it's going to have a problem. You know, he thought it was a show that needed music. And indeed, he did the drawing when the show opened in New York, but it was during a newspaper strike. And... Uh, this is, the, this is the sign of the times. There's a newspaper strike, and the theater critics were concerned that people wouldn't go to the theater without reading the reviews. So they started their own broadside called First Night. And the, at that time, about 10 theater critics in New York wrote, went to the plays, wrote the reviews, and, and compiled them in this, in this little newspaper uh, that, would have, that was literally just theater reviews. And of course, who are they going to get to illustrate it but Hirschfeld? Because for Hirschfeld, it was a great opportunity to do more drawings. Uh, so uh, uh, if you go to 95th Street between Park and Lexington, there's ivy all over the street. That's from Bucks County. That comes from S.J. Perlman's farm in Irwinna. He took a little sprig, and it took over 95th Street. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, in the back there. Oh, your last name is Hirschfeld. Well, that's fantastic. Al although, you know, so many people, you know, in 1977, St. Louis had, uh, 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 they invited Al to come out. They wanted to celebrate the, their hometown boy, and the mayor declared it, declared it Al Hirschfeld Day. And uh, Al gets off the train, and there are big banners all around, and on each one they have spelled his name wrong. <laughs> yes, you, I'm sure you get it a lot. Oh, no kidding. Oh, yes, the Hirschfeld Theater, sure. Sure. Oh, wonderful. Oh, sure, I know this drawing. Oh, it's a great drawing. Yeah, now, and the hair, you know, you just, yeah, that was, uh, did you go up to the studio to have it drawn? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. 
Yeah, he was he was really a great guy and a very social character, and you know, uh, uh, we spent a lot. We you know he was always drawing when I was up there in the studio, and uh, the only time he would stop drawing in the studio was at four o'clock when the housekeeper brought in the tea and cookies, and then we would break and again talk about anything, everything. We we rarely talked about his work because Al w had zero interest in the past. He he had I mean he just didn't think about it. He hired me in part, so I. So when people asked, he could say, "I have an archivist now, and he's put everything in order, and I can't find anything." But it was his way of uh, uh, of not having to deal with the past. You know, uh, he never did a, a portrait of me. Um, the only argument I ever got into with Al Hirschfeld was over a drawing that I wanted to buy from him, and he wouldn't let me buy it. He wanted to give it to me. And I said, oh, you know, Al, I work in museums, and that's a real church and state issue, and I'm going to have to buy it from you. And, and he's like, no, I'm, you can't buy it from me. We got into a, literally an argument over this until his wife came in and said, you have to take the drawing. And I did. And so, because I, I was always very sensitive, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's a couple of strokes of, uh, of a pen on board, how much can that cost Hirschfeld? But that's not how we, that's not how we value art. You know, it's, it's the end product. Uh, uh, you know, Prada shoes are not, are, are don't have that much material in them, but yet they go for a lot of money. So I, had, I was about ready to sign a, uh, a contract for a book I did up for Abrams on Irving Berlin. And I figured, oh, this is a way I could, I'll, I'll get Abrams to hire Hirschfeld to do my author's portrait. That way I could pay him. And I was so smart, and I signed the contract like two days before he died. So, bad time. I didn't think he was going to die. And neither did Al Hirschfeld, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, he was convinced. He was much more interested in other people than he was in himself. Right, he was looking for your character. Oh, I've oh I've seen him. Sure, uh, I do know your picture. I I, I tell you, the, probably the only person who's seen more Hirschfeld drawings than me is Bobby Al Hirschfeld, uh, and I'm not saying that as a brag. It's just I uh, I uh, uh, we we have copies of it in the archive. It was photographed at the time. I'm not making it up. <laughs> it still happens, believe it or not, it still happens. People bring me things all the time that we haven't seen, or better yet, we don't know where it is. I mean, because that's the thing with Hirschfeld drawings. They show up in very unlikely places. And uh, it's, I don't know what other people do for excitement, but when you, f you know, when you find that thing that nobody else knows about, or that is, hasn't, you know, you, you sort of rediscover it, what a thrill that is. And uh, fortunately, in my line of work, I get to do that pretty often. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, there was no real formula for how he did his drawings. Um, but when he got an assignment to do a show, uh, okay, so he gets an assignment. Frank Lesser's got a new musical. It's 1950, and Frank Lesser's got a new musical. It's called Guys and Dolls. And we need a drawing two weeks from now. Al would contact the press agent, find out where the show was in its out-of-town tryouts. And in this case, he went to Philadelphia. And uh, he would make his sketches. Now, the thing that Al did when he was making sketches in the theater while he was, uh, you know, really collecting information for his drawing is he was really focused on what was happening on stage. So much so that he really wasn't paying attention to what the play was about. That wasn't important to him. He wasn't providing that information. He was trying to capture the essence of the show. So um, he was looking for that gesture, the way someone stands, maybe a piece of costume that would sort of capture what it is about the show. So he would make sketches in a sketchbook if it was during a rehearsal, or if it was during a performance, he kept a little pad in his pocket. And he, uh, he drew in his pocket without looking, which seems counterintuitive because, I mean, an artist needs to look at the, what they're doing. But he thought it was like typing. You don't look at your fingers when you type. 
Why do you need to look at your hand when you draw in a situation like this? And uh, so in this little pad would have not just little drawings, but words. Um, and his sketchbooks would also have words that would not, the, the drawings showed what the thing looked like. The words described the feeling of what it looked like. So, uh, you know, the best example is he would write chicken fricassee about how an arm, uh, how, you know, fell along the side of a body or Brillo pad for uh, kinky hair. The one I love the best is uh, I was going through a sketchbook one time and there was a sketch of a buxom woman and Al wrote next to, he, he drew her, her bust and, you know, sort of her body, but, you know, with an emphasis on her bust, and he put next to it, behind on front, <laughs> which tells us everything. Uh, and then, so he would go back to his uh, studio, which from 1948 until his death in 2003 was on 90, was what, 122 East 95th Street. His studio was on the top floor of uh, his brownstone, and uh, he worked in a barber chair, uh, he thought it was the last functional chair in America because it went up and down, it swiveled, and if you got tired, you could turn it into a Shea lounge. And uh, there he worked on a board that was traditionally about 20 by 30 inches. Uh, and he would take, he would look at his sketchbook, he would often ask the press agent for photographs because he wanted to get the details right. He claimed he had a faulty memory, which was not true. And uh, then he would put it all together. He would collate all this information in pencil on the board. He would sort of sketch it out. And then when he figured out what he was going to do and the composition that he wanted to do, when the drawing was pretty much sort of uh, worked out in pencil, he would start to ink over it. And he would ink over it, and he only used, I mean, people think that uh, he must have had an array of pens and all kinds of techniques. He had one pen, it's one nib. If he wanted a thick line, he would go over that line to get the desired thickness. If he wanted a spittle effect, he would mask it out and dip a toothbrush into an inkwell and just spray it out, you know, a dry toothbrush and just spray it out. He, he was not someone, he never used an airbrush, never, you know, one time we brought up a computer uh, to him. We had, he, he was the subject of the first CD-ROM of a living artist, and I made the deal for him. And uh, as part of it, I knew Al was a gadget guy, so I told him that they had to give him a computer. This is 1994. And they brought up a drawing tablet as well, and they had uh, uh, Al working with it. And Al thought it was fantastic, but he said it's a whole other career. So, and when he finished inking the drawing, he would take out an eraser and erase all the pencil marks and then send the drawing down. He worked on an uh, uh, illustration board because you could give it, he would put in it, you know, his board size was really about 21 by 27 inches. That's not some golden triangle or anything like that. That was because the biggest envelopes he could find were 22 by 28, and he wanted the drawing to fit into the envelope. And he would put the drawing into the envelope, and then he would, if it was going to the New York Times, he would write their address on it, and he would often add drawings on the outside, and he would have little uh, things like warning, do not uh, um, uh, bold, uh, uh, fold, or dunk in hot chicken fat, you know, something like that. I mean, he was always, he had little jokes all over it. And in fact, a woman at the New York Times came to me after he died and said, I have all these envelopes, what should I do with them? And I said, well, where do you keep them? She says, I keep them in a box under my bed. I said, well, you can keep them there. <laughs> I mean, it's, they're wonderful, but they're, they're just, th they don't have the value of the, uh, the drawings. Um, he, when he first started working, he tried to get the drawings the same size as they were going to appear in the paper uh, because he thought he would get the best uh, reproduction if it was the exact same size. But then he came to the conclusion that that was the engraver's art and not his art. And so he wor started working on a much larger board. Um, and it, it really worked for him. Uh, he loved, it was all gesture to him. And when he did drawings, the Ninas would show up uh, um, organically. I mean, he had been doing it for so long that he was like everybody else when he finished a drawing. He had to count the Ninas. He had to find them and count them. And one time I was in the studio and he asked me to come over to his drawing table. And when I, I thought he wanted me to see the drawing and it was a great drawing. And he's like, how many Ninas do you see? And I thought, you gotta be kidding me. And he's like, I've only found four and I'm pretty sure there's five. And if I get the number wrong, there's gonna be a lot of mail which I thought was hyperbole, but sure enough, when he died and I went into this file cabinet before, uh, that was right behind his barber chair, there was, he, he kept the funny letters from people who said things like, 
oh, you know, one week he had gotten the number wrong, or the, the writer had claimed he had gotten the number wrong, and he said, and he wrote, I guess we're going to have to put Al Hirschfeld on the list of things we can no longer count on. You know, it was, it was insane. But that's, uh, Al loved that. I mean, the, the craziness of it. The whole Nina thing started off as just a, a prank for his family and friends. He never, never thought that it would take off in the way that it did. Uh, and when he tried to stop it after a couple of weeks, there was so much mail, it was easier to keep doing than to, um, than to stop, uh, than to answer all the mail, really. And uh, he tried to stop a couple of times, and he, he said he learned the hard way to make sure he put her name in the drawing before he put his name in the drawing, because no one ever cared, uh, no one was ever looking for his name, they were only looking for her name. And it, was, it wasn't until 1960 that he started putting a number next to his name when a reader wrote in and saying we, it would be helpful to know how many we're looking for. Uh, and after that point, if there was more than one, he put a number next to his name. Uh, the, re the really record holder is Whoopi Goldberg um, because when he, he, he got an assignment to draw Whoopi in her first one-woman show on Broadway called Whoopi Goldberg, and he goes to, uh, Whoopi told this wonderful story of she's rehearsing at the Lyceum Theater. It's only her, the stage manager, and her director, Mike Nichols. And she's, she's, she's doing this bit, and she looks out into the audience, and she's like, I can't believe the drugs are still in my system. There's Santa Claus. And Mrs. Claus, too, because... Uh, 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 and she does. She she finishes the bit. She goes off stage. She says to the stage manager, "I've got to lay down because uh, I just saw Santa Claus out in the house." And uh, the stage manager looks out and says, "That's not Santa Claus. That's Hirschfeld." And uh, and Mike Nichols hears and says, "Do you want to meet him?" And so Whoopi turns out is a big fan. Grew up like all of us. You know, her mother worked two jobs, but on Sunday night she came home with the Sunday New York Times and they looked for Nina's together. And she's telling this to Al, but then she says, but you know, sometimes I couldn't find all the Nina's. And I felt, uh, you know, I, uh, I felt slow and it hurt. And I don't know what Al must have been thinking, but you know, he smiled, you know. He goes back to his uh, studio, does the drawing. She, when w it, it appears in the Times a few weeks later and there's 40 Nina's in there. <laughs> And Whoopi's beside herself. She cannot believe it. In the uh, curls of her hair, you can't really see it in here, but it's in the curls of her hair and everything. And uh, um, she writes Al a, a, a fan note saying, thank you so much. This is so great. And 40 Ninas, you know, how wonderful is that? And Al writes back, I just wanted to make sure you could find all of them. <laughs> he had a great sense. Look, I'll go back and sign some book and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>